Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the second ever episode of On the Gridiron. I am your host, Matthew Heiserman, and when I made the first episode of On the Gridiron, we were 18 days away from the NFL season. Now I'm making this episode, episode number two, and we are just 13 days away from the season beginning. We're slowly but surely getting there. Before the season starts, I hope to have two or three more episodes. Of course, as the season is underway, we're going to continue this podcast, continue the growth. But today we have an awesome episode for you, breaking down many topics, including a lot of Commander's news, which is why I'm wearing my Jaden Daniels jersey today. But nonetheless, let's get right into it with topic number one. And topic number one is going to be talking about the Denver Broncos deciding to start the season with Bo Nix. And for Bo Nix, he had a really impressive preseason, I will confidently say. He threw 23 completions, 205 yards, and two touchdowns. Now, the thing is, when you're going to react to player stats in preseason, you have to realize They're going against backups. They're going against third stringers. And it's all about how it's going to translate against starters in real NFL defenses, which is still unclear for a guy like Knicks. Yes, he looked good in preseason, but I don't know if he's actually going to be able to play well against players in his division like Chris Jones or Max Crosby or if he's really going to struggle against good competition. That's still to be figured out. But when you look at the Broncos quarterback room, they have Zach Wilson, they have Jared Stidham. Zach Wilson, I think it's safe to say, was is a bust. He's not panning out how anyone hoped he would. And could I see them potentially using him maybe a little bit this season? Sure, if they have to but I don't think they'll want to. Jared Stidham, he's fine as a backup, and he's their other quarterback that they have. He's fine as a backup, but I don't think teams would be excited to have him as their week one starter. I think he's someone who has experience if you really need to use him, but he's your backup, your third string option, and I think teams would try to avoid him if possible, because he's he's fine, but he's not making the biggest impact on your team. I don't necessarily think he's leading to success. So while the quarterback room is in somewhat of a tough situation there in Denver, it seemed like a pretty simple decision to go with Bo Nix because I would say he is the best out of those three guys. Now with Bo Nix, Another problem that you have to address is his age. Of course, he's 24 years old. And just to put that into comparison, he's the same age as Trevor Lawrence. Trevor Lawrence is 24 years old too, and he's going into his fourth season in the NFL. So that kind of just tells you the late start that Bo Nix is getting. Of course, this is a pretty big setback. It could mean that he struggles to progress as much as other guys like Caleb Williams and Jaden Daniels will. Now, I do want to talk about what this overall situation means for the Broncos as a whole, starting Bo Nix. Now, the thing with the Broncos is I don't see them having much success this year, no matter who they start. At quarterback, I looked at their schedule earlier. Of course, they're playing the Chiefs twice this season. One of those games they might be able to win because it's week 18 where the Chiefs will most likely not be playing their starters. But they're also playing the Ravens. They're playing the Bengals. It's not an easy schedule. And I'm not even sure that they're going to have easy wins against teams like the Panthers. I think that those games could even be close, which is really unfortunate for them, but I don't think that they're going to have any easy wins this season. They have games that against teams like the Steelers, the Buccaneers, the Seahawks, that, of course, 
the opposing team would be the favorite. Maybe the Broncos could win those, but again, it's not likely. And I think the amount of wins I see them getting this year is around five to six, which isn't the best. But then again, it could be worse. It could be four, it could be three. So I don't ex- see them getting much success this year. And I don't think that's Bo Nix's fault, though, because I don't think that they'd do any better with Stidham. I don't think they'd do any better with Zach Wilson. I just think that the team's not that good overall. And in terms of maybe you were looking to draft Bo Nix in fantasy football this year, I know this is irrelevant to him starting, but I do like to talk about fantasy football when I talk about players during this podcast. and. In terms of Bo Nix, I would just try and stay away from him. I don't think he's proven anything yet to why you would want to select him. I don't think this is likely, but there is a situation where he gets benched. Maybe he's really struggling this season. And one of the most important factors when drafting a quarterback in fantasy football, actually there's two of them, it's who are their weapons. And are they able to run really well? Bo Nix, I don't necessarily know how he is on the ground, but I know it's not anything to necessarily be super excited about. And in terms of weapons, their average at best, he has Cortland Sutton, he has Tim Patrick, who he threw a touchdown to during preseason, Adam Troutman at tight end. So, I mean, his weapons just aren't great. Javante Williams at running back. I'm just not expecting much. I think that this offense is going to be really boring this season. I think the Broncos as a whole will be really boring. And I'm saying now that they will have one of the bottom five scoring offenses in the NFL by the end of the season. So, I mean, take that how you want. I don't think that this Bo Nix starting situation necessarily means the most for them. Of course, at some point, if he wasn't going to start the first game, he was going to start at some point during the season. But I guess there's no point in not playing him. You know, he's already 24, which I mentioned the bad part of that. But then again, he also has experience, I guess. And hopefully he'll be able to improve this offense right away and I'm not trying to say anything bad about a guy like Daniels, Williams, maybe Drake May but these guys could potentially struggle in areas that Bo Nix doesn't just because Bo Nix is older and he's more familiar with the game so maybe that improves their offense again I don't know I wouldn't expect much from him And overall, it's not going to be a pretty season for the Broncos, but hopefully he can uh, show hope to Broncos fans this year. And then Jaden Daniels was named the week one starter for the Commanders. And I want to do kind of an analysis between Daniels and Knicks at this starting role. And I think the difference here is that Daniels, in my opinion, was always going to be the starter because there's no situation where the commanders would want to play Marcus Mariota or Jeff Driscoll over Jaden Daniels to start the season. Obviously not Sam Hartman because he's a rookie as well. I think, in my opinion, could I have seen a guy like Stidham or Zach Wilson starting? Yes, I think it was a possibility. I didn't really see a possibility where Jaden Daniels didn't start. For me, it's not a surprise that he's starting, obviously. It kind of just mattered when they were going to announce that he was the starter. And it is a relief that we know that he is the starter. Now, something that may affect Jaden Daniels is the fact that he won't be passing to Jahan Dotson this year, which is what I want to transition into next. Obviously, Jahan Dotson got traded to the Philadelphia Eagles yesterday. The Eagles receive Jahan Dotson and a fifth-round pick. Commanders receive a 2025 third-rounder 
and two seventh rounders. And Dotson in his career so far has 1,000, 1,041 receiving yards and 11 receiving touchdowns. Now, I'm a Commanders fan, so I'm going to break this down a little more than I usually would or you might see from other people. But I think the thing that's really unfortunate for me is the fact that we took him 2022 draft in the first round, a 16th overall pick. And the fact that we're only getting basically a third rounder for him basically means that he was a waste of a pick overall. And that's really unfortunate. Now, of course, he was drafted in that Ron Rivera era when he was the coach. And I saw a graphic earlier that was really interesting. It was Ron Rivera's last first round selections. And it was Chase Young in 20. And this was overall commanders last first rounders. Chase Young in 2020. Of course, we traded him to San Francisco. He hasn't really done much now. He's in New Orleans. 2021, Jamin Davis. We still have him, but he is a backup. 2022, Jahan Dotson, now playing for the Eagles. And then 2023, Emmanuel Forbes, who has really struggled so far in the NFL. So overall, not necessarily the most hope for the commanders when drafting. But now we have Dan Quinn. Maybe things will change up a little bit. Now, speaking of Dan Quinn, I think... There's a point to make here about he wasn't necessarily the biggest fan of Jahan Dotson. And I broke this down a little bit during my last episode, but there is a situation where Dan Quinn was asked about, you know, the wide receiver two role in Washington well before Dotson got traded. And he said that they were still figuring out who that player was going to be, which came as a shock to many people because obviously you would think Jahan Dotson should easily have that role secured. Obviously, Terry McLaurin's wide receiver won, but Dan Quinn mentioned how Alameda Zacchaeus has been very impressive so far in training camp practices and that they're still battling for who will have that role. And that immediately, in my opinion, showed that Dan Quinn wasn't necessarily, as I said, a big fan of Jahan, and he still had many questions about him. Maybe potentially it was an attitude issue. Maybe he didn't like Jahan Dotson's attitude, but or maybe it was just that he wanted Jahan Dotson to prove himself because he had, of course, Rivera has seen Dotson play, but this is the first year of Dan Quinn. Dan Quinn is new to all these guys. And while Jahan Dotson was thought to be the second best receiver by a lot of fans, by probably most of the players on the team, Dan Quinn doesn't necessarily know that yet. And he needed Jahan Dotson to prove that. Now, the thing I don't necessarily love about this trade for the commanders is the fact that we sent Dotson to a division rival in the Eagles because I just think that there's a situation where this backfires because all you're doing is giving Jalen Hurts another weapon. And he already has enough weapons, honestly. He has, and this kind of goes into the fact that the Eagles wide receiver core is maybe the best wide receiver trio in the league. Actually, definitely the best. They have A.J. Brown, Devonta Smith, and now Jahan Dotson, of course. They have Saquon Barkley, who they got over the offseason. They still have Dallas Goddard, who's very solid. Yes, they lost Jason Kelsey, but their offensive line is still good. And another situation, this doesn't necessarily have to do anything with Jahan Dotson or the Commanders, but their defense also looks really impressive. And in the draft, I think they absolutely nailed the draft. They got both Quinion Mitchell and Cooper DeGene, and the Commanders could have potentially taken Cooper DeGene if they wanted to, but they traded that pick to the Eagles. 
And that seems to potentially have backfired, saying that Emmanuel Forbes has really struggled and we could have used DeGene as another cornerback because that is a position that the commanders need right now. So overall, it feels a lot like the Eagles are going to have an easy win to this division. Of course, yeah, the Cowboys won the division last year, but there's still concerns about C.D. Lamb and what's going on with his contract situation. They don't really have a running back anymore, and I just don't think that their team is as complete as it was last year, and I think the Eagles team overall got a lot better since then. So we'll see how that plays out. Now, a fun fact, I'm not one to believe in what's happened in the past and that there's necessarily something that's going to continue. But in the NFC East, uh, there has not been a repeat winner since, I believe, 2004 when the Eagles won two years in a row. And since then, it's the winner of that division has switched every single year. So if that says anything, which again, I don't think it does, the Cowboys will not be winning the division this year. And I know it won't be the Giants. I know it won't be the Commanders. And I overall think that the Eagles are just by far right now the best team in the division. Now, another situation that you could look at this as is maybe the commanders are trying to open up room to get a guy like Brandon Ayuk. Of course, him and the 49ers still haven't worked out a contract situation there, and it doesn't look like they're going to anytime soon. It's kind of been just a uh, standstill for them. Nothing has really changed at once. It looked like he was going to the Browns. That didn't happen. Maybe he was going to the Steelers. It looked like one morning it looked like that was almost a guarantee that that would happen in a few hours, and it didn't happen. And then now the commanders have a decent chance. And honestly, I don't think that's going to happen either. Ayuk had just it doesn't really seem like he wants to cooperate right now with the 49ers, and I don't know how long this is going to last. He won't. He probably won't play the start of the season with the 49ers if he's still on the team. I doubt he will actually play for them, but there just hasn't been any progress in finding him a team that he's going to go to. But if we did happen to get Ayuk, I'd be really happy. Get Jaden Daniels another weapon to put with Terry McLaurin, and all of a sudden we have a pretty scary wide receiver core. Now, Again, saying that's pretty unrealistic in my opinion. What would happen if we didn't get Brandon Ayuk? Well, I think that this could be a breakout potential season for Diame Brown. Brown has played really good so far in practices during the offseason. He did really good during training camp. And he was already showing a connection in preseason with Jaden Daniels. Daniels' first completion was a really long pass to Brown who made a really impressive reception. So hopefully he has struggled in his first two seasons in the NFL. I've been waiting for him to do really good and break out. It just hasn't happened. Now that is probably because we were going between Sam Howell, Jacoby Brissett, a bunch of quarterbacks who don't really matter. And now we finally hopefully have our franchise quarterback. And I don't want to get my hopes too high, but I think this could finally be the year for Diame Brown. Of course, another name I mentioned that Dan Quinn said was Olamide Zacchaeus, who has played good. He's also played good in preseason. He's played good training camp practice. He's looked like a stud. Luke McCaffrey is our rookie brother of Christian McCaffrey. And... I'm not necessarily expecting him to be wide receiver number two this year because he's a rookie. He still has to get used to things. He still has a lot of time to get better, though. And I know that in the future, he could be a very big threat for defenses. Now, that's kind of what I wanted to talk about with the Jahan Dotson situation. We talked about some quarterbacks starting roles. Now, I have two last topics that I want to break down real quick before we finish up episode 
two. So the first one is Creed Humphrey earlier today agreed to a four-year, $72 million contract, which makes him the highest paid center in NFL history. And at this point, for the Chiefs, it's just do whatever you can to protect Patrick Mahomes. That's all that matters. And it's been a struggling offseason, I would say, for the Kansas City Chiefs. Kelsey just came off one of his worst seasons, where she Rice obviously has been getting into some trouble. Some other players have been doing questionable things off the field. And, I mean, of course, I like the pick of Xavier Worthy, but right now, the Chiefs team has a lot of questions. Do I think they'll be really good this year? Obviously, I do. But one of those questions that they don't have is whether Patrick Mahomes will be good. Of course, he'll be good. But they just really want to make sure that they, he has the best offensive line to put with him. Because honestly, at the end of the day, he's making Mahomes making insane amount of money. Best player in the NFL, in my opinion. Just can't have anything bad happen to him. Now... Another thing that I saw earlier is that Creed Humphrey is only 25 years old. And I think when you talk about offensive linemen, their age is kind of irrelevant. Not that it's irrelevant, but it's never talked about. You don't necessarily know how old offensive linemen are, and it doesn't really matter. All that matters for also offensive linemen is whether they can protect the quarterback. That's kind of all people care about. And I think they're just overall an underappreciated part of the game. But saying he's 25, he has a lot of time left in his playing career, and he has the potential to be a superstar. He's already a multiple-time champion. He's already a multiple-time pro bowler. But the future is bright for Creed Humphrey. And then the last thing I want to talk about is the Atlanta Falcons. I know it sounds really random. But I am very high on them come going into this season. And I kind of just want to explain why on YouTube. I made a YouTube short about this. Go check it out if you haven't already. But I did a quick breakdown of why I liked the Falcons so much this year. And, of course, the first reason that comes to mind is that they signed Kirk Cousins in free agency. Desmond Ritter was just overall really struggling last year. He did not have a good season whatsoever. I think he threw something like nine touchdowns and nine interceptions. Just really inconsistent, a bad quarterback, non-reliable. And then you have offensive weapons. You have B. John Robinson, Drake London, Kyle Pitts. Now, honestly, B. John Robinson should be a lot better than this year than he was last year. And that's because he was being very misused by Arthur Smith. And that's another point I wanted to bring up. Arthur Smith now is the coach of the Steelers. Uh, and I think he just wasn't using B. John correctly. He wasn't using him enough. He wasn't using him in the right situations. He used Tyler Algier a lot in the red zone, and he went to non-irrelevant players a lot of the time. I know this has kind of become a joke, but how much he went to guys like Mikhail Pruitt, you know, but I mean, it really, it really just was questionable coaching, and it definitely held back some of his players and obviously the whole team success. And then the defense has been really upgraded so far this offseason. Just in the past few days, they've signed Matthew Judon. They've signed Justin Simmons, and that's to go along with Grady Jarrett, uh, Jesse Bates, who's the best safety in the NFL, arguably, and A.J. Terrell, who just got signed to a really big extension. And then obviously they play – in most people would say the worst division in football. I would agree with that. The Panthers went two and 14 last year. Of course, they're still in that rebuild process. And then the Buccaneers and the Saints are solid. They're good to get you eight or nine wins in a season, but I don't see them getting any more than that. But I do think that the Falcons could get a good 10, maybe 11 wins this season and definitely win the NFC South. So I'm excited to see how they're doing. And overall, I think it's just going to be a big step up for them. 
But with that being said, that's going to wrap up the second ever episode of On the Gridiron. I am your host, Matthew Heiserman, and we will see you next time.